was hit. Mr. Speaker, Madam President, Madam Chief Justice, Lieutenant Governor Rogers, members of the legislature, cabinet officers, leaders of the Kansas tribes, honored guests, and my fellow Kansans. It is my high honor to stand before you this evening to report on the progress of my administration and to share my plans for the year ahead. We have much to discuss tonight, but before I begin, uh, please join me in welcoming back the third first gentleman of the state of Kansas, my husband, Dr. Ted Doughty. I think, I think last year I introduced him as the long-suffering Ted Doughty, and that continues until today. Uh, you know, Ted still misses his garden we had at the other house and his dark room, but he's adjusting to our new home by adding some personal touches. He has taken an interest in putting the cedar back in Cedar Crest with the planting of new trees. He also started a vegetable garden, and he even has his own compost pile. And don't any of you go there. <laughs> In addition to all of that, he continues to practice medicine full time. So Ted and I have settled into life at the governor's residence. In fact, it was the backdrop for our family's biggest news of 2019. It was a joy to watch our daughter Kathleen wed our new son-in-law Matthias at Cedar Crest earlier this year with our younger daughter, Molly, standing by her sister's side. <laughs> Speaking of siblings, my sister Kay and my brother Paul are also here tonight from Colorado. <laughs> and because it's 2020, Listening online from Richmond, Virginia, is my brother, Father Fred. As everyone here knows, it is not easy to be related to someone who serves in public office. I am grateful to my family for the support they have provided for me from the very first day of this journey. Since we're talking about family members, though, I dare not exclude the four-legged variety. Frances, the first cat of Kansas, sends her regards. <laughs> you know, if there was one thing I didn't expect this past year, it was the widespread interest in my cat. <laughs> She's made lots of new friends on social media, and she gets more news coverage than I do. <laughs> Francis asked me to relay a special, special message to Lieutenant Governor Lynn Rogers, who's here with us along with his wife, Chris. Lynn Francis said to tell you that she's very close to exceeding your following on Twitter <laughs> and that you need to step up your game. As everyone here has no doubt come to know, Lynn Rogers is an exceptional lieutenant governor. Uh, in case you couldn't tell, he is also unfailingly good-natured. Lynn hit the road almost as soon as we took our oath of office last year, logging more than 17,000 miles on a statewide listening tour, engaging Kansans in our efforts to establish the Office of Rural Prosperity. Housing shortages, affordable child care, revitalizing Main Street corridors, protecting rural hospitals, expanding rural broadband. These are all concerns that weigh heavily on the minds of Kansans. With the right mix of state support and local ingenuity, I'm confident that the Office of Rural Prosperity 
will serve as an invaluable partner for Kansas communities to sustain and enhance our state's rural heritage. I want to thank you, Lynn, for all the hard work you've done on this incredibly important issue. In fact, I, I'd also like to give a shout out and thanks to my entire cabinet uh, seated in the West Gallery just behind me. No governor can succeed without a strong and supportive team, and I could not have asked for a more qualified group of leaders to help rebuild our state. <laughs> You know, I realize for those who have been around the Kansas Capitol a session or two, these annual messages might sometimes seem a bit routine. But tonight carries a very special distinction. For the first time in Kansas history, women sit at the helm of all three branches of Kansas government. It is my privilege to serve as our state's third female governor, alongside the first female Senate president, Susan Wagle, and the second Supreme Court, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Marla Lukert. Kansas reached this milestone at a fitting moment, as 2020 also marks the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment which granted women the right to vote. <laughs> Anniversaries and New Year's are always important opportunities to reflect on time gone by and on progress made. Uh, we have another opportunity this evening as we usher in not just a new legislative session, but a new decade. So let us go back for a moment and remember where we've been. Almost 10 years ago to the day, we gathered in this chamber for the 2010 State of the State Address. Kansas found itself in the throes of the worst economic downturn in 80 years. The Great Recession had necessitated $1 billion in spending cuts. Another $400 million budget gap still loomed before us. It was brutal. It's probably best that we did not realize in that moment that that would be the brightest fiscal outlook Kansas would have for another seven years. Of course, you know what happened next. A new administration was in place one year later, and the saga of the failed tax experiment began soon thereafter. Instead of recovering from the Great Recession along with every other state in the nation, Kansas settled in for six more years of financial chaos, and this time it was self-inflicted. By the time I stood before you as governor in 2019, Kansas was on life support. The state had racked up record amounts of debt, schools had been cut to the bone, taxes on groceries, had increased until they were the highest in the nation. Agencies had been decimated, and Kansas had generally become a national model for what not to do. After devastating cuts and relentless crises, a bipartisan coalition of lawmakers demonstrated courage and conviction when they joined forces in the face of adversity to stop the bleeding in 2017. That bipartisan effort, one that so many of you helped bring to fruition, changed everything. So although it was a decade in, in which much went wrong, we rebounded in a way that only Kansas can. Over the last 12 months, Kansas has added 12,400 private sector jobs. The state not only reached a new employment record 
our unemployment rate fell to its lowest point in 40 years. Since I became governor, we fulfilled our promise to properly fund Kansas schools. We reinvested in public safety and worked tirelessly to stabilize our foster care system. We increased pay and lowered health insurance premiums for thousands of public employees and their families. We're paying off debt so that we can eventually establish a state rainy day fund and better prepare for future financial emergencies. In U.S. News and World Report's best states rankings, Kansas jumped seven spots in 2019. We now rank 15th highest in education. We scored seventh best in infrastructure. In fact, I'm proud to report that we improved in almost every category, including the economy, and fiscal stability. I'm also proud to report that in CNBC's annual Top States for Business, Kansas was declared the comeback state of 2019. Above all, above all, I am proud to report that Kansas has ended a turbulent decade on a high note. As we look to the future, the state of our state grows stronger every day. We have so many reasons to be hopeful tonight, but make no mistake, one year of progress cannot erase a decade of damage. Two of the most important sectors of the Kansas economy remain incredibly fragile. As a major Boeing supplier, Spirit Aerosystems was hit hard by the recent suspension of the 737 MAX production. Even as we speak, thousands of Wichita families are suddenly fearful that soon they may be unable to provide for their families. I've been in constant communication with local, state, and federal officials since temporary layoffs were announced late last week. I've instructed my Labor Secretary, Delia Garcia, to take an all-hands-on-deck approach to helping workers, Spirit, and other Kansas businesses that will be negatively impacted. Unfortunately, Kansas agriculture also finds itself at a precarious moment. Between historic flooding last spring and escalating trade tensions over the last two years, net farm incomes have dropped 50% from their peak in 2013. Congress could certainly help, and they could start by ratifying the pending USMCA trade agreement. I have, been, I have been a vocal proponent of the USMCA agreement from the beginning. I commend the U.S. House of Representatives for passing this agreement, and I urge the U.S. Senate to do the same soon. It's critical for Kansas. We are indeed an export state. And on that note, with us tonight is our second largest customer from Canada, I'd like you to welcome Consul General Stefan Lassar. Thank you for being here, Consul General. When it comes to the livelihood of Kansas families and businesses, we won't wait on Washington and the USMCA agreement, however. We must take matters into our own hands. The International Trade Division at the Department of Commerce was dismantled in recent years. I've instructed my Commerce Secretary, David Tolan, to focus on rebuilding this division. As I said before, Kansas is an export state and we cannot compete in a global economy without strong international trading partners. 
we must breathe new life into our efforts to increase exports and compel international companies to choose Kansas. But I'm not just focused on convincing companies to choose Kansas. I'm also focused on the people who've chosen Kansas. The effort to reconnect people with their state government and to rebuild public trust starts at the top. From day one, I've wanted Kansans to hear from me about what we're doing and why we're doing it. Kansans deserve to engage directly with their governor. That's why I've hosted Kansan to Kansan town hall meetings regularly since I took office. This fall, when I was building the state budget, I went on a listening tour to hear directly from the people about their priorities. I've talked extensively and candidly with Kansans about what we've accomplished and where we'd like to go in the year ahead. In turn, they've spoken candidly with me about their concerns and how state government can better serve them. I'd like to share their thoughts and concerns with you and what I think we can do about them together in 2020. I promised Kansans that I would be the education governor. I consider the progress we've made on public education to be our most important accomplishment to date, but we have more to do. Last year, I stood here and asked you to put aside partisanship and work with me to finally provide schools with the resources they need to be successful. You did it, and I applaud you. I was proud to see <laughs> applaud yourselves. <laughs> I was proud to stand with many of you that Saturday morning last April as hundreds of public school teachers packed into the ceremonial office to witness the signing of legislation that would end a decades-long legal battle over school finance. It was truly a remarkable moment, not just because of what we accomplished, but how we accomplished it. None of the teachers who attended this bill signing cared if it was a Democrat plan or a Republican plan. They cared only that their schools would be funded, that it might help improve Kansas teacher salaries, which rank 41st in the nation. They cared that it would ensure educators have what they need to serve Kansas children well. Let's keep that in mind as we forge ahead. Restoring school funding was a critical first step but now I challenge us all to engage in a bigger and bolder conversation about what's next. Soon after taking office, I established the Council on Education. I asked the Council to reevaluate every corner of our educational ecosystem, early childhood, K-12, higher education, and workforce development, and to bring those players to the same table. I also engaged business and industry, labor, and other stakeholders so we may cultivate the workforce that Kansas will need to compete in the years ahead. It is time to align all of these moving parts so that we can put Kansas on the forefront of growth and innovation. I lost it. I want to recognize tonight the co-chairs of this council, Dr. Cindy Lane, the former KCK public school superintendent, and Dr. Fred Dirksen, current superintendent of Dodge City Public Schools, who are here tonight in the gallery. Thank you for all your hard work and the hard work yet to come. Our progress on education is a valuable reminder to all of us that Kansans do not keep partisan score, even when clever sports analogies are employed. Kansans care about results. That's what we get when we work together. You know, we can deliver bipartisan results again in 2020. 
and we can start with one of the most urgent issues we face. This must be the year that Kansas becomes the 37th state to expand Medicaid. Apparently, apparently you've heard that Kansas made a little bit of news uh, on this front last week. After weeks of tough negotiation and lots of give and take, we developed a proposal that will not only expand health care to 150,000 Kansans, but also has the potential to lower health insurance premiums in the marketplace. It was an honor to stand with so many of you, Republicans and Democrats, representatives and senators who have been committing, committed to getting this done for Kansas. We have so many reasons to bring this across the finish line. In July, a study of mortality rates in non-expansion states estimated that 288 Kansans have died prematurely from 2014 to 2017, specifically due to our failure to adopt expansion. Another study released in November showed that expand, expansion improves infant and maternal health. Yet another found the rate of rural hospital closure increases significantly in non-expansion states like Kansas. Just last week, a study was released that linked Medicaid expansion to a decline in opioid abuse. There is a stack of rigorous nonpartisan evidence to illustrate how critical can care expansion is to the health and welfare of our state, and it grows by the day. So does public support. The number of expansion states continues to increase. No state has reversed its decision to expand, and voters across the ideological spectrum continue to reaffirm their support for expansion in election after election. I'm talking about in states like Kentucky, in Louisiana, in Virginia, states where access to affordable health care drove people to the polls. I'm talking about Nebraska, where 54% of voters approved Medicaid expansion by ballot initiative in 2018. I'm talking about Oklahoma, where in October, a record number of petitions were submitted to put Medicaid expansion on their ballot in 2020. And yes, I'm even talking about Missouri, where expansion is well on its way to a statewide vote, with momentum growing by the day. So if nothing else, surely maintaining Kansas's 159-year tradition of beating Missouri is something we can all get behind. In all seriousness, as I said last week, compromise is hard. It is messy. It is slow. But it is so worth it. Now it's up to all of you to finish the task. When we add this to our list of bipartisan accomplishments, we will not only save lives, it will close the book on a long, senseless, expensive political fight, making room to improve access to health care and grow the Kansas economy. We are so close. Let's get this done. As we continue our work to rebuild Kansas, there's one area where we mean it literally. It's time for us to develop a new comprehensive transportation plan so that we can rebuild roads and bridges across our state. My Secretary of Transportation, Julie Lorenz, and her team have spent months hosting community meetings to ensure that all Kansans communities, large and small, have the opportunity to help shape the future of infrastructure in a way that meets local needs. Infrastructure is about far more than just roads and bridges. It is the means by which our school buses safely transport 
our most precious cargo. It's how we ensure Kansans' daily commutes are faster and safer so they can spend more time with their families. It means jobs, thousands of jobs. And as an export state, it is how we get Kansas goods to market and keep our economy humming. This will be the fourth time Kansas has pursued such an endeavor. Each plan has improved upon the plan before, adapting to exchanging needs, adapting to changing needs throughout the state and building on lessons learned. Each plan has propelled Kansas to the future, making our transportation system one of the very best in the nation. There's one lesson from the past in particular I hope you will keep in mind as we begin this new process. Even the best laid infrastructure plan will crumble if we do not maintain the resources we need as a state to see it through. As promised last year, I officially began closing down the bank of KDOT. I'm fully committed to continuing that phase out throughout my first term so that we can fulfill the promise of the previous transportation plan and invest in the future. But I've... But I've always been clear that this pledge comes with one critical caveat, stable state revenues. Rebuilding fiscal stability in Kansas state government has been one of my top priorities as governor. Last January, I presented a balanced budget to the legislature without raising taxes, a budget that paid down debt, reinvested in core services like education and health care, all while leaving the largest ending balance in more than a decade. The budget didn't quite return to me with all those features intact. The budget that came back to my desk in May included $182 million more in spending than I had recommended. It did not maintain the statutorily required ending balance we need to cushion state investments in case of an emergency. It also spent more than we were taking in. The good news is that Kansas's economic outlook has stabilized, and it has even improved a bit. While the risk of a recession will always remain a possibility, the foreseeable future does not appear as ominous as it did last January. That is why tomorrow, for the second year in a row, I will submit to you a balanced budget that continues our rebuilding efforts, that continues to pay down debt, and that honors my promise to cut taxes. Kansas families are taxed more for food than anywhere else in the United States. These families shouldn't have to pay more than their fair share, especially when it comes to the essentials. So my budget will take the first step in lowering taxes on groceries, starting the, with the Kansans who need the help the most. I've always considered lowering the tax on groceries an urgent need, but ultimately we must work our way back to that long-standing notion of the three-legged stool. We must rebalance all of our revenue streams, income, sales, and property tax. The Kansas tax structure has become more than a little lopsided in recent years, which is why my budget will also include property tax relief. As funding for schools, cities, and counties was cut over last decade, local units of government were left with few options to make ends meet. Increasing property taxes was one of them. This left local communities frustrated and put a desperate strain on working Kansans and Kansans living on fixed incomes, particularly our seniors. They need relief and we can give it to them in 2020.
Together, the food and property tax relief I will offer will take a meaningful stride in rebuilding our overall tax structure so that it is far more balanced and far more fiscally responsible. But it is only the first step of what must be a multi-phased, multi-year process. I understand that any discussion of taxes is politically charged. But if we ever truly want to move forward, we must confront the stark inequities, the outdated inefficiencies, and the expensive loopholes riddled throughout our tax code. To this end, I established a Council on Tax Reform last summer to develop such comprehensive common sense reforms. I'd like to recognize now former Democratic Senator Janice Lee, who is here with us in the gallery. <laughs> and former Republican Senate President Steve Morris, who could not be with us tonight, uh, but... <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank them both for spearheading this bipartisan effort. The Tax Council's work will continue into 2020. In the meantime, the Council identified a targeted food sales tax cut through a refundable rebate and broad property tax relief as two initial steps we can and should take as a state to begin the long process of rebalancing our revenue streams. Before I move on, I ask you to have a little faith. As governor, I have worked diligently to honor every promise I've made to Kansans. I've also worked to include you as my partner in the governing process every step of the way. My commitment to working with you on tax reform is no different. I began my remarks this evening with a quick stroll down memory lane, but not because the last 10 years were filled with such pleasant memories. I started there because I don't want Kansas to go back there. We simply cannot go back. So I wanted to be clear to protect our recovery and to ensure Kansas does not repeat the mistakes of the last decade, I will veto any tax bill that comes to my desk, that throws our state back into debt, back into fiscal crisis, and sends us back to court for underfunding our schools. I hope you all won't stand for it either. This has been an eventful year. One year ago, our social safety net was in shreds. Together, we took action. We hired dozens of new social workers across the state to better support vulnerable families. We created special response teams and amplified collaboration with the KBI to more quickly recover missing foster care youth. We brought nursing homes back from the brink of financial ruin without closing a single facility. We bolstered funding for mental health in efforts to confront an alarming increase in suicide. And as you will hear more about tomorrow, after five years, we've made preparations to lift the moratorium at Osawatomie State Hospital. One year... <laughs> One year ago, our correction system was in crisis. Prisons were dangerously overcrowded and staff shortages fueled consistently volatile situations. It led to violent inmate uprisings at multiple facilities. The situation was so dire at El Dorado that I was forced last February to declare a state of emergency. Together, we acted, investing $30 million to reduce overcrowding, address staff shortages, and enhance safety in our prisons. Today, the situation is stabilized. The emergency declaration has been lifted. The Corrections Department, under the leadership of Secretary Jeff Smuda, 
is providing more programming to help reduce recidivism and shift from an approach that's purely punitive to one that emphasizes rehabilitation and workforce training. By partnering with businesses to train these inmates in badly needed job skills, we can both help the private sector fill their workforce shortage and set our incarcerated population on a path to success when they leave the corrections system. By expanding, by expanding and innovating our capacity for substance abuse treatment and mental health treatment, we can bend the curve on our prison population long term, improve public safety, and strengthen Kansas communities. We have now laid the groundwork for a serious discussion about comprehensive criminal justice reform. These are the kinds of things we can accomplish when we act together. The last decade was one of fits and starts, to be sure. And yes, there will be challenges in the decade ahead that we cannot foresee at this moment. But last week, Kansas Republicans and Democrats stood together to announce a bipartisan compromise on an issue that had been mired in gridlock for years. Kansas proved once more what's right with our state. We stunned outsiders who watched the disastrous policy of the previous decade unfold and had all but written us off. And if we're being honest, we may have stunned ourselves. So my hope is that 10 years from now, when this body convenes the first session of that new decade, it will look back and remember this as the soaring 20s, a decade when we lived up to our motto, ad astra per aspera. God bless our great and beloved state of Kansas. Thank you and good night. My fellow Kansans, good evening from our state's capital. Hi, I'm Ron Reichman, the Speaker of the Kansas House. Thank you for the opportunity to talk with you about the future of our great state. I also want to thank Governor Kelly for sharing her ideas with us tonight. As Kansans, I know the governor and Republicans in the state house both want a bright future for our state, but we differ in our vision on how to get there. When my kids were little, sometimes they came running when they fell off their bikes and we would put a Band-Aid on their scraped knee and everything would be fixed. The state has tried that same approach for years, putting a Band-Aid on budget problems, hoping to make things better. That might work for a scraped knee, but we know it doesn't work for gaping fiscal problems like the one our state has faced in recent years. Just as my kids have gotten too old for Band-Aids, the Band-Aid approach has gotten old for Kansans. Kansans are tired of budget gimmicks that simply kick the can down the road tired of courtroom battles that divert funding away from critical services like mental health and foster care, and tired of government intrusion that makes it harder for job creators in working Kansas to get ahead. Tonight, I urge the governor to join us in our mission to make Kansas work. In order to do that, we must get beyond the short-term fixes. We must work together to form the long-term solutions our families deserve. We must end the era of government that works for bureaucrats and instead make Kansas work for us, the people. That starts with fiscal responsibility. The government has a duty to act with fiscal discipline so that all functions of our state can flourish, not just a select few chosen by court litigation or political elites. Rushing to spend millions of dollars on new programs will do more than just grow government. It will divert funds away from those critical programs like mental health services, our foster care system, and our, hard, and our highways. Putting new programs ahead of fully funding our existing services will lead to calls for Kansans to send more of their hard-earned money to Topeka, leaving behind less and less for our families and our communities. 
Right now, because we've insisted on fiscal discipline and accountability, the state has finally emerged from a budget hole with a surplus this year of $343 million. But Governor Kelly's agenda stands to spin the state back into a hole, leaving Kansas underwater within the year. The governor's plan would have the state spending $209 million more than it brings in, and $274 million more than it brings in next year. And it continues year after year to dig the state into a deeper budget hole. So how does the governor plan to address this problem? By taking another $4.4 billion in debt by refinancing the CAPERS retirement system. It's disappointing to see this proposal back on the table. Three years ago, the governor herself said refinancing in this way would, and I quote, unravel all the work that's been done to ensure the fiscal responsibility of CAPERS. Yet the governor has again turned to this option, another Band-Aid approach that would amass a mountain of debt for our children and our grandchildren to pay, all in order to generate quick cash for her spending. The only way to guarantee security for our state budget and for our teachers and for law enforcement officers and other public retirees is to stop using CAPERS as a credit card. Last year, House Republicans, joined by our Democratic colleagues, voted down the governor's credit card tactic, and we will vote it down again. The bottom line is this. The state cannot continue to spend more than it brings in, leaving Kansans like you and me to pick up the tab. The second priority is civil discourse. At a time when social media pot shots and personal attacks have become the norm, we seek to set the tone for civil discourse so that all Kansans have a voice, not just those who yell the loudest who can pad the pockets of politicians. We helped change the course of politics last year by banning anonymous bills and increasing transparency. Today, the legislative process is accessible to every Kansan who wants to be engaged in their state government. Every committee meeting and every floor debate is streamed live online under the watchful eyes of Kansans, as it should be. This year, we've invited our colleagues, both Democrat and Republicans, both senators and House members to embrace civil discourse with training designed to break down partisan barriers and, and, and encourage productive policy conversations. Through continued efforts like this, it is my hope we can make our state government more about solutions and less about election year promises. Our third priority, growing our state instead of growing government. Let me be clear, no difference in our vision is more stark than this one. On the one hand, the governor wants to add more government programs. She wants to grow spending and hope that we will grow the state. I grew up in a small western Kansas town, and I know that government program never made anybody move to my hometown. What brought people to town was a good job and a great quality of life. If we want to grow our state and give our children and our grandchildren a reason to stay, the answer doesn't lie in the governor's type of growth. We Republicans have been hard at work on a different type of a plan, one that uses limited government, partnered with private investment, to fuel the fires of innovation, renewal, and growth. In the coming days, we will roll out a specific solution to address sustainable rural health care, rural housing, and workforce development. Our vision relies on building upon what already makes Kansas great, its people, their honesty, work ethic and commitment to do right. Our vision seeks to take that talent and give it, to, give it the opportunity to blossom into a workforce trained to meet the demands of today's economy. We must ensure that every Kansas kid, no matter their hometown or their home they've grown up in, has a chance to achieve the education and training they need to obtain a good paying job. That kind of growth, the kind that works for all Kansans, not just those who have the governor's ear, will bring more jobs and more resources into our state, including our rural communities, without continually treating taxpayers like an ATM. As Republicans, our vision for the future is simple. For too long, state government has worked for trial lawyers and bureaucrats, instead of working for the people. We must break that cycle and get Kansas back working for all of us. I hope the governor joins us in pursuing that vision so that every Kansan and every community can build a brighter future. God bless you, and God bless the great state of Kansas.